the important thing is that we grasp the central hope of the ultimate resurrection set within the new creation itself and that we reorder all our thinking and speaking about every other after-death question in that light. Whenever I have spoken about these issues over the last decade or so, someone always asks, what about hell? This question really demands a book in itself, and I am torn between my lack of desire to write such a book and my recognition that one must at least say something. Part of the difficulty of the topic, as with the others we have been studying, is that the word hell conjures up an image gained more from medieval imagery than from the earliest Christian writings. Just as many who were brought up to think of God as a bearded old gentleman sitting on a cloud decided that when they stopped believing in such a being, they had therefore stopped believing in God, so many who were taught to think of hell as a literal underground location full of worms and fire, or for that matter as a kind of torture chamber at the center of God's castle of heavenly delights, decided that when they stopped believing in that, so they stopped believing in hell. The first group decided that because they couldn't believe in childish images of God, they must be atheists. The second decided that because they couldn't believe in childish images of hell, they must be universalists. There are, of course, better reasons for becoming an atheist and better reasons for becoming a universalist. Many who occupy one of those positions have gone by a much more sophisticated route than the ones I just described. But, at least at a popular level, it is not the serious early Christian doctrine of final judgment that has been rejected, but rather one or other gross caricature. The most common New Testament word, sometimes translated by hell, is Gehenna. Gehenna was a place, not just an idea. It was the rubbish heap outside the southwest corner of the old city of Jerusalem. There is to this day a valley at that point that bears the name Gehinnom. When I was in Jerusalem a few years ago, I was taken to a classy restaurant on the western slope of this famous valley and we witnessed a spectacular fireworks display, organized no doubt without deliberate irony, on the site to which Jesus was referring to when he spoke about the smoldering fires of Gehenna. But as with his language about heaven, so with his talk of Gehenna. Once Christian readers had been sufficiently distanced from the original meaning of the words, alternative images would come to mind, generated not by Jesus or the New Testament, but by the stock of images, some of them extremely lurid, supplied by ancient and medieval folklore and imagination. The point is that when Jesus was warning his hearers about Gehenna, he was not as a general rule telling them that unless they repented in this life, they would burn in the next one. As with God's kingdom, so with its opposite. It is on earth that things matter, not somewhere else. His message to his contemporaries was stark and, as we would say today, political. Unless they turned back from their hopeless and rebellious dreams of establishing God's kingdom in their own terms, not least through armed revolt against Rome, then the Roman juggernaut would do what large, greedy and ruthless empires have always done to smaller countries, not least in the Middle East, whose resources they covet or whose strategic location they are anxious to guard. Rome would turn Jerusalem into a hideous, stinking extension of its own smoldering rubbish heap. When Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, that is the primary meaning he had in mind. It is therefore only by extension and with difficulty that we can extrapolate from the many gospel sayings that articulate this urgent, immediate warning to the deeper question of a warning about what may happen after death itself. The two parables that appear to address this question directly are, we should remember, parables, not actual descriptions of the afterlife. They use stock imagery from an ancient Judaism, such as Abraham's bosom, not to teach about what happens after death, but to insist on justice and mercy within the present life. This is not to say that Jesus would have dissented from their implied picture of post-mortem realities. It is rather 
to point out that to take the scene of Abraham, the rich man, and Lazarus literally is about as sensible as trying to find out the name of the prodigal son. Jesus simply didn't say very much about the future life. He was, after all, primarily concerned to announce that God's kingdom was coming on earth as in heaven. He gave, as we have seen, no fresh teaching on the question of the resurrection apart from dark hints that it was going to happen and happen soon to one person ahead of everyone else. For the rest, he was content to reinforce the normal Jewish picture. In the same way, he was not concerned to give any fresh instruction on post-mortem judgment apart from the strange hints that it was going to be dramatically and horribly anticipated in one particular way in space-time history within a generation. We cannot therefore look to Jesus' teaching for any fresh detail on whether there really are some who finally reject God and, as it were, have that rejection ratified. All the signs, of course, are that he went along with the normal first-century Jewish perception. There would indeed be such people, with the only surprise being the surprise experienced by sheep and goats alike at their fate and at the evidence on which it was based. And the early Christian writers go along with this. Hell and final judgment is not a major topic in the letters, though when it comes it is very important, as for instance in Romans chapter 2 verses 1 to 16. It is not mentioned at all in Acts, and the vivid pictures toward the end of the book of Revelation, while being extremely important, have always proved among the hardest parts of Scripture to interpret with any certainty. All this should warn us against the cheerful double dogmatism that has bedeviled discussion of these topics, the dogmatism that is both of the person who knows exactly who is and who isn't going to hell, and of the universalist who is absolutely certain that there is no such place, or that if there is, it will at the last be empty. And in many quarters has, rightly in my view, come to see that there must be such a thing as judgment. Judgment the sovereign declaration that this is good and to be upheld and vindicated and that is evil and to be condemned is the only alternative to chaos. There are some things, quite a lot of them in fact, that one must not tolerate lest one merely collude with wickedness. We all know this perfectly well, yet we conveniently forget it whenever squeamishness or the demands of current opinion make it easier to go with the flow of social convention. The problem is that much theology, having lived for so long on the convenience food of an easy-going tolerance of everything and the inclusivity with as few boundaries as muck world, has become depressingly flabby, unable to climb even the lower slopes of social and cultural judgment, let alone the steep upper reaches of that judgment of which the early Christians spoke and wrote. But judgment is necessary, unless we were to conclude, absurdly, that nothing much is wrong, or blasphemously, that God doesn't mind very much. In the justly famous phrase of Miroslav Volf, there must be exclusion before there can be embrace. Evil must be identified, named, and dealt with before there can be reconciliation. This view is therefore sometimes known as annihilationism. Such people will cease to exist. That word, however, is perhaps too strong, suggesting that such people are actively destroyed rather than merely failing to receive a gift that had been held out to them and that they consistently rejected. Over against these three options, I propose a view that combines what seem to me the strong points of the first and third. The greatest objection to the traditional view in recent times, and the last 200 years have seen a massive swing toward universalism in the Western churches, at least the so-called mainstream ones, has come from the deep revulsion many feel at the idea of the torture chamber in the middle of the Castle of Delights, the concentration camp in the middle of the beautiful countryside, the idea that among the delights of the blessed, we should include the contemplation of the torments of the wicked. However much we tell ourselves that God must condemn evil if he is a good God, and that those who love God must endorse that condemnation, 
As soon as these pictures present themselves to our minds, we turn away in disgust. The conditionalist avoids this at the apparent cost of belittling those scriptural passages that appear to speak unambiguously of a continuing state for those who reject the worship of the true God and the way of humanness which follows from it. Using that analysis, though, presents us with the following possibility, which I believe does justice both to the key texts and to the realities of human life of which, after a century of horror mostly dreamed up by human beings, we are now all too well aware. When human beings give their heartfelt allegiance to and worship that which is not God, they progressively cease to reflect the image of God. One of the primary laws of human life is that you become like what you worship. What's more, you reflect what you worship not only back to the object itself, but also outward to the world around. Those who worship money increasingly define themselves in terms of it and increasingly treat other people as creditors, debtors, partners or customers rather than as human beings. Those who worship sex define themselves in terms of it, their preferences, their practices, their past histories, and increasingly treat other people as actual or potential sexual objects. Those who worship power define themselves in terms of it and treat other people as either collaborators, competitors, or pawns. These and many other forms of idolatry combine in a thousand ways, all of them damaging to the image-bearing quality of the people concerned and of those whose lives they touch. My suggestion is that it is possible for human beings so to continue down this road, so to refuse all whisperings of good news, all glimmers of the true light, all promptings to turn and go the other way, all signposts to the love of God, that after death they become at last by their own effective choice, beings that once were human but now are not, creatures that have ceased to bear the divine image at all. With the death of that body in which they inhabited God's good world, in which the flickering flame of goodness had not been completely snuffed out, they pass simultaneously not only beyond hope, but also beyond pity. There is no concentration camp in the beautiful countryside, no torture chamber in the palace of delight. Those creatures that still exist in an ex-human state, no longer reflecting their maker in any meaningful sense, can no longer excite in themselves or others the natural sympathy some feel even for the hardened criminal. I am well aware that I have now wandered into territory that no one can claim to have mapped. Jesus, Christians believe, has been to hell and back, but to say that is to stand gaping into the darkness, not to write a travel brochure for future visitors. The last thing I want is for anyone to suppose that I, or anyone else, know very much about all this, nor do I want anyone to suppose I enjoy speculating in this manner. But I find myself driven by the New Testament and the sober realities of this world to this kind of a resolution to one of the darkest theological mysteries. I should be glad to be proved wrong, but not at the cost of the foundational claims that this world is the good creation of the one true God and that He will at the end bring about that judgment at which the whole creation will rejoice.